is a D6 generation pip. Uh, yeah, one of those dots on the side of a six-sided die. Yeah, a pip, you know, a short pip, a little, little something you know, about anything gaming related. Sometimes featuring Craig, sometimes featuring Russ. We'll see what's coming up today. Hey everyone, welcome to another D6 Generation. It is August, near the end of August, 2019. Uh, and you know what me- that means? That means it's time for back to school. That's right, teachers and students facing that daunting prospect of having to get back into the routine of lesson plans and book learning and reading, writing, and arithmetic and all those sorts of things we do here. And I know it's always kind of a little bit of a letdown after the nice relaxing time of summer to jump back to school. But for the rest of us, it's just another Manic Monday. That's right. So, uh, of course, because it is back to school time, Craig is busy with all those back to school things, leaving me alone to record this episode. And since I'm alone, unencumbered by his presence, uh, that came out wrong. No, no, I miss Craig dearly. It's much more fun to do these with him. However, since he's not here, I thought maybe I'd talk about a game that I am thoroughly enjoying most pleased with acquiring, uh, and that Craig, uh, I would say he uh, likes it, but uh, I would also say that he um, does not love it, and so oftentimes those games don't get talked about on the show as much, uh, but I thought I'd sneak it in here. And that game is British versus Pirates, which I think we've mentioned in Achievements a couple of times, but I just got British versus Pirates Volume 2. And this adds a whole other layer to the game. So uh, it's by a company called uh, Exocrate Games. Exocrate Games. uh, uh, And this dude Apollo runs the whole thing. And I ran into him at PAX Unplugged last year, at PAX Unplugged 2018. uh, Acquired the first version of the game with all the trimmings. I've played it quite a few times. I think I mentioned that uh, when we talked about uh, Dice with Discussions, the little group, where we're using, um, you know, uh, games to unite people of different political backgrounds and just see if we, over a game and a little bit of food, we can sort of talk politics without really upsetting anyone and hear each other's views, not with an, uh, you know, an, an effort to persuade, but more just an effort to understand. Is it possible that people can have different political views and neither side be evil, right? Um, and so I've been doing that for a while, but what I've liked about British versus Pirates for that format is it's a light game, so it plays very quickly. You can play a game of this easily under an hour, even with four players. Um, but it's got a lot of meat on its bones, and with Volume 2, I was really curious what they would add. So let me describe the game for those of you who are maybe unfamiliar with the original. So British versus Pirates is a, I would say, a light version of a naval combat game. Uh, Age of Sail, right? So, you know... Uh, Ships of the Line and uh, frigates and, you know, uh, uh, Aubrey and Maturin, Master and Commander, Merchants and Marauders, all that stuff, right? That's the Jack Sparrow. We're in that realm. Now, the original one, uh, the original box was literally came in the box of British ships and pirate ships. And what's neat about it is it comes with plastics and there are a lot of little models and they're very ornate, um, but they're small. So each ship is maybe a half an inch to an inch tall, depending on size. Um, and each faction has three sized ships, so three different molds. Um, the board in the original game, the board is, uh, it comes with a bunch of tiles that you lay together to form your C and the tiles have different, uh, you know, beautiful sort of like artwork to look like you're on the ocean. The tiles are covered with hexagons because the game is based on hexagonal movement. And, um, the uh, tiles also have different islands on them that are named with different ports. And this becomes important for both scenarios, but also the, the, the newer game as well, the new edition. Um, so you have all these tiles that are two-dimensionally flat. You have all this artwork of where the islands are on the tile. The game also, the original also comes with a cool little uh, weather vane that functions as the direction of the wind, so you know the wind gauge. Uh, and that usually goes in the center of the board to indicate wind direction. Um, uh, and the other the thing the game comes with, in addition to these really cool little ships, is it comes with a bunch of cards and a bunch of D6s. Uh, and the basic way the game works is each player 
has a card in front of them to represent each of the ships they have sailing about that they control. Uh, and the bulk of the mechanics center around the fact that there's a top-down view of your ship where you can easily see on this card, you can see the little art on the top of the card to tell you if it's a fluke or a ship the line or whatever, a uh, little name. Every ship is different, too, so there's a bunch of cards for each class of ship. So you don't just play a generic ship of the line. You're actually playing a very specific ship with a specific name, typically a historical ship, uh, and they all have slightly different stats. So uh, they might have slightly different cannon statistics, or they might have slightly different boarding statistics, or they might have slightly different uh, armor on different facings. Um, so it's really cool that each ship is, or different amounts of turns they can do, pivots they can do per turn, so how maneuverable they are, right? So really a lot of things going on there. The other thing that's cool is each card also has an icon on it that shows you how fast the ship moves depending on where the wind is against her. So some flukes love the wind a beam or love the wind actually a couple points off the bow or even love the wind coming straight across the bow. Other ships like the wind full astern, and it's not always dependent on class. So there are large ships that like the wind from different directions, and there are smaller ships that like the wind from different directions. And if anyone's ever done any actual sailing or read a lot of books about uh, you know, age of sail, uh, sailing ships like Audrey Master and those kinds of things, you'll know that they often talk about the fact that different ships, as captains take over new ships, they learn the idiosyncrasies and the nuances of that ship. And it is true that some ships prefer the wind at a certain spot to get optimal sailing. So I love that little mechanic too. There's all kinds of nods to cool stuff here, but the game is really very simple. So uh, for speed, for example, you simply look at where your ship is, and because you have hexagons, you have different facings for your ship, right? So you can easily tell, based on the hex, is the, is the wind straight uh, from the beam, you know, straight starboard or straight port? Is the wind, uh, you, know, you know, starboard bow or port bow, or is the wind uh, astern either direction, right? And so all you do is you look at the direction of the, of the weather vane, you look at how it's hitting your ship, and then you look at your card, which shows how many hexes your ship gets to move, depending on where it starts relative to the wind, right? So you just look at the wind, you look down at your card, and like, oh, my ship likes it a beam. It can move three hexes. Great. And the other part to movement is there's a number of pivots your ship gets to take uh, during its movement phase, and that's also on your card. So it'll say pivot one, pivot two, pivot three. Uh, and all that means is you can pivot your ship either at the start or the end of its movement, but not during its movement. And I like that mechanic because it makes figuring the wind out very simple. So if you pivot at the start of your movement, you pivot, whatever you want to get to based on the number of pivots you can do. And then you simply look at the direction of the wind now based on your pivot. And that's how many squares you get to move straight ahead or hexes you get to move straight ahead. Uh, similarly, if you pivot at the end of your movement, it doesn't really matter because you've already done your full move. So it's very simple. Uh, and then you can attack and attack in combat is also very simple. So there's a little chart on each card that indicates the number of dice you get to throw per range to your enemy ship, which kind of indicates the total firepower of your ship. And there's also an accuracy row that indicates the modifier you get to roll to add to each of your dice, uh, depending also on the range. So some ships throw more dice at different ranges. So some ships like close range, and they throw a lot of dice close range and less dice as you go away. Other ships like longer range and throw more dice at long range and less dice close up. The accuracy also can vary and is not connected to that. So you have some ships that throw a lot of dice at close but are more accurate at long. Other ships throw lots of dice close and are very accurate at close. So they've got a lot of nice little nuances here uh, to represent, you know, the gunnery talent of the ship versus the total, you know, gun weight of the ship, uh, number of gun ports, uh, just really, really neat stuff happening there. Then, uh, to figure out the target number of your enemy, this is also very slick. Um, so as I mentioned, there's a top-down view of each ship on your card. And uh, on this top-down view, there are actually little squares one square on the starboard, one square on the port, one square on the bow, one square on the stern, and one square in the center. And these little squares are exactly the size of those little small, you know, those, not the micro, but the small D6s. And so the game comes with a bag of all these D6s that are not really meant for rolling. They're actually meant to put on the ship card. So you put a D6 in each of these spots, and each of these spots has a number printed on it indicating the starting and maximum value of the D6. So you put Let's say the starboard box is a three, so you put a D6 and a three side up there. The port box is a three, you put that there. Maybe the bow's got a four, maybe the stern's got a two. You put your dice down. That indicates the current armor of those locations. And you guessed it, when you are trying to shoot the enemy ship, what you're going to do is you're going to roll your dice pool indicated by your cannon stats, and you're looking for successes per die. And the target number you need to achieve 
is the current armor value of the enemy ships depending on the direction you're shooting at them. So I'm shooting at your starboard side. I would look at your starboard D6, see what it's currently at. We'll say it's a three. Also printed on the card next to that D6 slot is another number, which indicates any bonus to armor. So some ships have a built-in armor bonus that's always there regardless of the die's at. So you might have a three for your armor value on the side, plus two. So my target number is five. So if my cannon pool is I'm going to roll three D12s, and, and attack dice are always D12s in this game, I'm going to roll three D12s, and my target number is five, every die that comes up five or better is a hit on the enemy. And don't forget, I also might have an accurate accuracy bonus. Now, typically, it's something like your armor value on the side or, or a starboard or bow starts at a four or even a five sometimes, and then there's a bonus of two. So you're sometimes you're needing like five, six, and sevens, and eights on a D12 to hit, which is not guaranteed. Um, the other thing that's cool is, so what's cool about that is then if I do damage, so every die roll I successfully beat the target number of does a point of damage, and so the player being shot reduces the D6 on that side of his ship by one for each successful hit. So as you can imagine, what's happening over time is my armor is being reduced on certain from certain directions for each hit that gets scored. So nice battlefield damage. The cooler part is uh, when that die is reduced to zero, so when my last armor pip goes away, you remove the D6, thus exposing the square the D6 goes into. And in that square is also a critical hit effect that's now in effect for the ship the whole time. So if your stern gets blown out, you will your pivots get reduced, so now you're less maneuverable. If your starboard or port gets blown out, depends on the ship. Might reduce your firepower, might reduce your sailing speed, right? Um, so it's really cool. So you got critical effects happening also. Then, as I mentioned, there's also a center square in the middle of the hull, and that's your hull points. So anytime you get hit after the full armor on the starboard port bow or stern is gone, those hits then go to the middle value, the, the, the middle die, and you start reducing that. And ownership, that starts at six. And when that's reduced to zero, you sink, right? So pretty simple mechanics, very easy to understand. You'll master the art of combat in like 30 seconds with this game. But a lot of things I love here, right? Battlefield degradation, uh, different flanks uh, uh, or different directions from the ship will slowly get worked on. So you'll eventually want to continue to attack the ship from a particular side, which means your opponent, as your starboard side gets heavily damaged, you want to keep that port side to the enemy. So again, a lot of the things you'd expect to see in a naval in an Age of Sail game are there, uh, but super simple mechanics. Love that. So combat's very simple. Other things that add to the fun, in addition to the ship card, each player also gets a captain card. There are lots of different captains per... Oh, by the way, I should say that these ship cards are specific for faction. Uh, and as I mentioned, there's multiples per ship class. Uh, and in the starter box, there are a lot of ship plastics. So I want to say there's like, I don't know, three or four of each type. So three or four of small, medium, and large ships, uh, which means I want to say there's like... Um, 9 to 12 of each model. It feels like there's a ton because I'm trying to paint them all. So in the base box, you get a bunch of these uh, plastic British and a bunch of these plastic pirates. Um, in addition to the ship cards that I just described, you also get these captain cards, which add uh, additional stats to the ship. So some captains, and captains also like certain sizes of ships. So the captain's card will say things like, if he's commanding a small ship, he adds plus one pivot to the ship's value, or he adds to the boarding or repelling value. Now, the captain card also has a D6 on it that indicates the crew's morale. Uh, so that usually starts at six. And then things can happen that lower the crew's morale. So there are these uh, action cards you get to play also. And these action cards are also specific per faction. So you'll have a bunch of these things and you can play them. I mean, and this is where the game folds in like wind change and things like that. So you get one of these cards, you can change the wind to the way you want it. You might get a card that lets you fire grape shot or a special kind of attack or whatever. And most of the time, these cards have a morale cost. So to spend them, there's cards that heal your ships. To spend them, then, uh, you spend morale on your captain. At the start of each turn, your morale goes back up one. But also boarding actions, which are very simple in this game. It's basically when the ships get close, you can do a boarding action. You roll a D6, you add your morale, plus your captain's boarding uh, value. When you're defending, you roll a D6, or sorry, D12. You roll a D12, and you add your, um, your captain's, your crew's morale value, plus their repelling value. And ships have a core value for repelling and boarding, and so do captains, so they add together. So the, so this is a total complement of your ship, right? So a lot, a lot of variety here. There's different kinds of cards per class. There's also different captains, so you can mix and match that and get a lot of things going on. The other thing I really liked about the core version of uh, the game is that it came with um, 
two ways to play. So there's sort of the bring and battle, build your own fleet thing and go at each other, which I honestly have not tried. Or there's this little sort of make your own adventure scenario book. So what do I mean by that? <laughs> so uh, there is a little scenario booklet. Uh, and the first battle talks about has a little story. And it's about there's this, uh, you know, pri- pirate ship sailing along and the British are trying to stop it or whatever. I can't remember the exact scenario. And so you play the scenario and I describe exactly the number of ships and which players are what. And you could, we played it four players, actually, with each player commanding one of the ships per faction. So in this scenario, there were two ships per faction. We played it four of us, each player commanding one. We had a great time. Game wrapped up in like an hour, and it was super easy to set up to. Um, and it gives you a little story for what happens depending on which side wins. And then it says at the very bottom, if the British win, play the scenario on page three. But if the Pirates win, play the scenario on page four. So like you'll make your own adventure books, you now go to that scenario and that scenario continues the story based on the results of the first scenario and so forth. And we played through that entire thing, I think, over two sessions. So we ended up, because it was so fun, we played uh, two games, got through two scenarios real quick. And the next time we met, we played through the other two or three scenarios, and I played through the whole story. Um, so there's not that many scenarios. Now, you can play it over and over again, um, or you can just play the little bring and battle game. That's pretty good, but not huge amounts of replay value, but good fun. And, of course, you can make your own scenarios. But... What the promise of Volume 2 was, was that it was really going to add a lot more depth to the game. Uh, and they did just that. So Volume 2 just came out uh, this spring, I want to say, like late spring, early summer. And um, I got mine. Uh, I didn't back the original Kickstarter, um, and I had just missed the Volume 2 Kickstarter. Um, uh, no, no, I did back the Volume 2 Kickstarter, but I didn't back it all the way. And ended up buying everything else on eBay. Uh, you can get it now. I think it's on eBay. I think you'll also see it on Amazon in many places. So it's pretty easy to get British versus Pirates now. What they did with Volume 2, I really, really like. I think it's still a little light for Craig's taste as a two-player game. But I think he does like it as a four-player game. Um, but basically what they've done is they took the original game. They've added a lot more factions now. So you can still play the original game mode, uh, but there's more factions. So now they've added the Spanish Armada. They've added the French. They've added the Buccaneers. So the, the Volume 2 box, right, if you buy the Volume 2 box, it's everything you need to play Volume 2, um, and you get French and Buccaneers. If you have the Volume 1 box, it's everything you need to play Volume 1 style, and it is, more about the style in a second, and it is uh, the British and the Pirates. If you have both, you can now mix and match those different factions in either play style, right? Uh, and then... Um, there is more factions that are available at standalone boxes. So there is um, the South Seas Alliance, which brings in the ships you normally associate with uh, China or Japan. So you got the little uh, junks and those kinds of ships. They look awesome. They're the little, uh, they look great. Uh, and then you also have um, the, uh, the Spanish Armada. So you have the Spanish now and all their great ships as well. Um, so you now have uh well, four, six factions, right? So you've got the two factions from um, the original British, Pirates, French, Buccaneers, Spanish, and South Seas Alliance. So six different factions. So already the, my rule of four rule about a, about a miniature game, problem solved. Each of these boxes t- comes with a ton of ships. So I think, again, you're looking at nine to 12 ships per faction with, I think, three for each size class. Um, uh, and again, all those cards I described before. But what they did in volume two was they added a little more depth to the game and made a version of it that's playable that's a lot more like a board game. So it's still the same look and feel. <clears throat> it's still tiles with hexes. But instead of it being sort of a combat game, uh, feeling like a miniature combat game where you're either fighting, you know, bring a battle, build your fleet and duke it out, or you're playing, you know, that scenario rule, which, again, both feels like a miniature game, this feels more like a board game. So in this mode, uh, you're going to have... Uh, a board set up in a specific way with a specific set of islands on it. Uh, and it's quite a, lar- a pretty large setup. And there are event cards, but also mission cards added to the game. And so now what happens is it puts a light layer of kind of merchants and marauder, marauder slash pickup and deliver slash missions to the thing. So when you end up getting a mission, and the mission will say, you know, go to this port uh, and do this skill check and see if you can rescue this prisoner or well, on your way, if you sink an enemy ship, you get an extra victory point, that kind of stuff. Or go to this port, pick up uh, some, you know, some wood and go deliver it to that port. 
Um, so very much it's got that merchant marauders layer on it. While when you complete missions, you can level up your ships. So in this in this little board game version, you start with all small ships. You start with certain captains, and as you progress, you can level up your ships and make them bigger classes and different classes and tweak them to based on your missions, which is pretty neat. Um, and so there's key ports you're sailing around. You're trying to get victory points faster than your opponent. But, of course, as you're sailing around, uh, those victory points stay on your ship when you achieve them, and you have to go put them back in your home port to sort of bank them and keep them safe. So now your ship is a nice, fat target when it's sailing around with all this cargo and things on it. And now there's also stats on the ships for cargo. So now you can, it's going to get that merchant marauder feel. You can totally play merchanty, um, or you can go start sinking your opponents. What's also neat about this is it starts adding fantasy elements and more depth to the game. So also each faction now has a plastic fort miniature that goes on the table near their home port. Uh, and what that allows you to do then is if you try to go near the enemy's home port in the, in the board game version, you're going to run into the fort. But also you could bring the fort into a bring and battle game, just have a fort ship the raid or anything else. The forts have full stats. They work just like the ships, but they're just stationary. They have their own card. Really pretty slick. Each fort is fashion, faction specific for both how it's sculpted, but also the stats on the card, which I also really dig. Um, they also kick the game's uh, sort of tabletop appeal and components up a notch. So if you buy just volume two um, by itself, you get the kind of same components as volume one. All the cool plastic ships. You get the weather vane. You get the tiles for the board. Um, uh, and, uh, you get, and the, and the islands are right painted on, the, you know, artwork on the board, but you can also buy, and I did, <laughs> uh, the terrain expansion and the neoprene mat. So you can also now get a cool neoprene mat that's the size of all the tiles put together, but it's got no artwork on it except for awesome looking ocean. I love the way they did the ocean, this thing, and the wave effects and the, the different colors of the ocean looks awesome. And there's a little spot in the middle where you put the, uh, the wind dial. Uh, so that's always in the same spot. Uh, but then um, there's also a box of 3D islands now that are all sculpted, which look fantastic. And on the side, they have the name of each port on them. And so you put the little 3D islands on the neoprene mat, and now you've got what looks like a miniature game with all these little islands on it that plays like a board game, which I'm loving. So I love how it looks. I'm having a blast painting these things up with contrast paints. Um, looks really, really great on the tabletop. But here's the better, beautiful part. It plays super fast. Um other things they've added to the game, which makes it fun, is they've added a little fantasy element to it. So there are now event cards that happen. So each round, uh, you draw an event card, and these could be anything from bad weather to shoals appear, and you put them on the map. So the map evolves as you play now with event cards. But there are also sea monster cards, uh, and this brings in three-dimensional plastic sea monsters into the game. And this has caused a little bit of debate in the community because the way the cards are set up is that the player who draws the card gets control of the sea monster, and it's just his sea monster. So it's kind of like that captain happened to find a sea monster, and now it's his best bud, and he works for him. <laughs> Which is, quite frankly, Craig got it in our game, uh, but he still lost. Um, but it was annoying, but I just kind of ran around it. Um, but I can see why that'd be frustrating. So some of the folks have introduced, um, you know, sort of AI, you know, homebrew AI rules where the sea monster just moves around, or you rotate which player controls the sea monster each turn. Whatever works for you. I don't really... The, the event cards are kind of sometimes balloons and sometimes bummers. It just depends on what you draw. So sometimes it could be you find extra stuff or you get a free upgrade to your ship or something. And sometimes it's like, you know, bad storm happens. So, uh, again, it adds a random element to the game. Not everybody's going to like that, but it does have that sort of merchant maraudery sort of RPG feel where you're just out there trying to learn a, earn a living as a merchant or a pirate. And sometimes bad luck's going to happen and how you deal with it, right? Sometimes, you know, uh, Davy Jones is going to show up with a Crockett, and he, what are you going to do? you got to fight him. Uh, so uh, I didn't mind that too much. But, you know, if you're playing it as a serious competitive game, which I don't recommend because that's, that's not its, you know, its jam. It's really just sit back, relax, beer and pretzels. You know, I'm using it to talk politics with my friends or whatever and just sail around the islands and, and, and have a cool story unfold and who knows what's going to happen. It's great for that. And what I really like about it, because it plays so fast, uh, you know, you, if, if it is going poorly for you, it's not like you're stuck in a four hour game where you're just having bad luck over and over again. Right. Um, one other thing they did that I really enjoyed is they've added a lot more skills to the ships and they released for very short money. I think it's like five dollars or seven dollars. They've reprinted all the ships from the original cards from the original game and all the captains from the original game with the new mechanics so they can play in the board game. So. What I mean by that? Well, the ship cards now have a lot more skills on them. So before the ship cards just had like boarding and morale skills. 
And now there's all these sort of um, RPG style skills around stealth uh, to sneak in and out of ports uh, and maybe diplomacy. And I can't remember what they are, but there's all these different skills. And you don't have to understand them, except that when certain missions come up, there'll be skill checks you have to pass. Uh, and what will happen is you'll look at your different ships and figure out which ship is the right ship to do that mission. Um, because each ship now has different skills there, too. So it makes the ships even more unique and the captains more unique. Um, so you, that's also going on. So what they need to do is re- reproduce those cards for the older game so that if you wanted to use British and Pirates in the new board game version, you could. And you can. And they released forts for those as well. So now you've got forts for all the all six factions also. So um, I'm really enjoying British versus Pirates. I'm having a great time painting it up. I love the fact, I really love this idea that I can have my little miniature gaming fix on. I can paint up some beautiful models, paint up a beautiful uh, scenario, uh, and then just um, throw down on my friends, uh, you know, for a quick beer and pretzel game. Everybody gets a nice enjoyment. It looks great on the table. Um, so I'm really, really, really enjoying um, this whole concept of uh, of, uh, of British versus Pirates. I'm loving volume two. Uh, Apollo and the, and the guys over at uh, Exocrate, I hope I'm saying the right games, um, they're doing a great job on their Facebook page of constantly updating, uh, you know, new ideas. They're sharing new rules or beta testing. They're constantly talking about tweaking things. Um, you know, some folks would like a little more depth to the boarding rules. Oh, one thing they also added, I should mention, is uh, in the new volume two, they added additional movement options and additional shooting options. So now... When you shoot, instead of always having to have a card, for example, you can choose whether you're firing grape shot or chain shot, for example. Um, or you can choose when you're moving, maybe you just want to attack, which means you um, don't get to turn, um, but you but you move less, but you turn more. Something I can't remember exactly what it is, but there are some really nice little options there. They get you out of out of sort of j- tight jams, um, which I really like. But they have penalties. So, for example, if you shoot one type type of shot, shot, it's better in one scenario, but worse in the other vice versa. So it didn't, it didn't take away. We mostly ended up using the basic stuff a lot, but there was a few times where having that option was handy. So again, they're just adding a little more layers of complexity to, to give it a little more depth, but I still love how it plays fast. And I remember Craig was very concerned when I started breaking out all the new stuff. Uh, and I hadn't even read the new rules, honestly. So I, I sat down and like, we're going to try the new volume two. And he enjoyed volume one when we played with other friends but he knew he enjoyed it in the context of beer and pretzels. And this time it was just us together. It was kind of our normal gaming days. Like, I kind of want something to meet here. Well, I brought it out all anyway, and I hadn't learned it. I was really worried it was going to take a long, long time, and it didn't. So in the end, he was like, I really like that it didn't take a long time. I think it'd be more fun with more people, though. I think with two players, it's a little trivial. Um, and that's probably fair. I think with two players, um, you know, you can't really spoil each other and still do your missions. So you kind of, it, it's not a solo game, because we did fight each other a few times. Um but it's less interaction than I think if you had four players, because you had four players, someone's going to be in someone else's way a lot more on the board, uh, and you're going to start to, to mess with each other a lot more. So I think that'd be a lot of fun, too. So check it out. If you're into Age of Sail games, uh, definitely take a look. If you check out the D6G feed on both Facebook and Twitter, you will see the models. You'll see pictures of the mat, um, you know, all set up with the islands on it. You'll see pictures of the models. You should be able to find this. Um, I have never seen it at a friendly local gaming store, so I don't think it's in distribution. I have seen it, as I mentioned, on Amazon. It's, of course, on uh, – if you Google British versus Pirates, you'll see the Exocrate Games website. Um, you can get it all from them. They ship rather fast. I've ordered some things directly from them, too. Uh, and you can also get it on um, – I'm sure on eBay. And he seems to go to most of the cons. So if you go to PAX or PAX Unplugged or you know any of those other – Gen Con or anything – you will probably run into him there and find uh, British versus Pirates. So uh, I'm really enjoying it. I'm loving it. I hope you give it a try, too. If you see someone playing at a store, ask to take a look at it. I think they'll enjoy it as well. Uh, so there you have it. That is it for uh, this week's episode of the D6 Generation. Um, super uh, excited for fall. Uh, I know all of our friends that, again, teachers and students are bummed, my girls as well, about going back to school. But um, – I love fall because, you know, uh, A, it's just another workday for me, but B, here in New England, it's just a beautiful time of the year. It's getting nice and cool. The leaves are starting to change colors. Um, and uh, it's just a great time to go for hikes in the mountains, which I love to do too. As a matter of fact, this weekend, I'm going camping. Looking forward to that. All right, everyone, have a great one, and we'll talk to you next time.
Achievement unlocked! You've made it to the end of another D6 Generation episode, the podcast whose humor has universally been acclaimed as not too horrible. Please let us know what you thought of the show by emailing us at info at the d6 generation.com if for some inexplicable reason you actually enjoyed this show you can help others find out about it by leaving positive reviews on itunes thanks for listening and happy gaming